I would love to welcome all of you here this afternoon. We have a real special treat. Um, we have three of the staff that worked at the Straight Theater here with us. I want to welcome Hillel Resner. I want to welcome Ginny Resner. And I want to, and I want to welcome uh, our, uh, Luther Green. <laughs> Welcome, Luther. You're going to have a private nickname for me forever. My name is Rebecca Nichols. I'll be moderating this, and i got to let you know what a treat this is. Just having the three of you on film uh, together is, uh, is historical. And alive, it's, too. We're alive. Well, you're more than alive. It looks like you've got a lot, a lot of running and a lot of stuff to keep doing. Um, I'm inspired by it, I'll tell you totally. Um, so here we are today in 2005, um, talking about uh, the 60s and the Haight-Ashbury, and of course you can't talk about the 60s and Haight-Ashbury without talking about the Straight Theater. Um, that was a loved uh, uh, part of the 60s and, and part of the Haight-Ashbury, and just about anyone and everyone that was there in that time passed through those doors, has additional stories to tell. But now that we have you all together, we'd like to know the truth. <laughs> and, and as you see it, you know. Um, uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you, and I would love to, in the very beginning, just through the memorabilia that you have with you, be able to tell some stories, share some experiences, uh, talk to each other, remind each other, oh, you forgot this, you forgot that. Um, you know, it's the way it is, and I mean, right here on this stage, I think there's more memorabilia than, than exists totally on the straight theater. Um, we've already learned a lot of things. We learned about the hard work in opening it. We learned about uh, many, many volunteers through the times. I'm way interested in any photos you have, any information, any names that you can give us, uh, any, any events, things that happened, uh, memories, funny stories private information, whatever you want to tell us, um, we really appreciate it. So I'll start with you, uh, Hillel. Well, I'll get a good starting point. I already showed this picture before. Sure. But We'd the, love to see it again. The outside, sure. you know, of the theater. Um, That's the... Uh, street scene back in the... In the 60s. While we were still putting the place together. That's great. Um, we haven't painted what, the marquee yet. No, well, th that's exactly where I was going. One, one side of the marquee was painted. There was a design that was that was uh, penciled out uh, by Dennis. What's his name? Stearns, your friend, yes. Dennis Stearns. Tell us about Dennis Stearns. Well, Dennis was he's a young painter, and he wanted to. He had a design. He wanted to paint these flowers and this really beautiful. Scrolling vines. scrolling vines on the marquee of the Straight Theater. And um, he was up there one day and painting, and he came down, and someone had borrowed the ladder. <laughs> so we spent the rest of the afternoon up there trying to figure out how to get down. He finally <laughs> figured it out. <laughs> Did he have a bosun's chair? He, he had used the bosun's chair to get up to the very top, yeah. yeah. And he ended up painting the... But, you know, like a lot of things there, it was an unfinished, you know, production because it was always a question of getting, not just getting money, but people finding the time, you know, because it's not like today when, okay, we're all going to work now and we're going to get this thing done. It's like, you know, you might be on your way to the theater to paint the marquee and meet some beautiful young woman with, right. you know, some LSD and you were gone, you know, maybe for a week, right? So, but the point is that only the one side of it ever got painted, and so that this side, you know, was blank. Which was the side blank? The, uh, the, um, west side. The side, uh, that would be the west side, did not get painted. The side as you were coming down Haight Street, uh, did get painted. I don't know that it actually got completely finished, you know. Wonderful. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, Dennis now designs, you know, professional recording studios. Uh, he's a master contractor, you know, genius kind of guy, Perfect. actually. Amazing. I think it's important to be able to also kind of give people an idea of what the structure of the theater is. At that point in time, 
Luther created a um, drawing that kind of outlined the layout of the theater, who it was owned and operated by, what the productions were, and, and what the audio is. And it's, it's quite, an, I think, a, an interesting little piece and, and a historical piece because it really does give us um, some and context. Flatten the page a little bit. Yeah. Tilted towards us. Yeah, towards yeah it, perfect. It, it, yeah. It's, it's, you know, this is pretty small and it's hard to see. So but what what was that used for? Was that used as a handout? or What did you create? Yeah, I have no idea. I don't remember. See, this, that's <laughs> what he used to do, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, he'd just start drawing something. Luther's a, a very accomplished artist. You yes, know? He would, it's he, wonderful. He would have been a hugely successful cartoonist if that was all he wanted to do. Right. Cause he really had a, a, a genius for that, you know, so. Well, I, I found in his interview very humble, so I would love to, uh, any of you to point out some of it. So, so just to, to give you an idea of, of some of the physical reality of what we were dealing with, it was a 4,200 square foot dance, stage, and auditorium area. And um, what was its capacity, did you know? What was the capacity? Oh, I think you could get like 1,200. But that was only after, see, it, it was a movie theater. Sure. And we tore all the seats out in order yeah. to create a dance. Half, most of half the seats. Yeah. Out. And so, did we end up with forty-two hundred square feet? I, I don't know. Well, it's that's where, it's where it says to. Yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> yes. Okay. In any event, it must be true. Um, owned and operated by uh, Jim Wilson, Bruce Dizel. Is that how you say Dizel? Gene Williams, who is Reggie. Uh, Bill Reznor, Hillel Reznor, Brent Dangerfield, uh, Luther Green, and a cast of thousands. Sure. Uh, it had a projection room and an electronics lab. And the productions were um, are of the highest quality, include movies, concerts, plays, dances, environmental circus, <laughs> experimental trips. Uh, director Luther Green, associate director Hillel, uh, the, we've got the stage manager, uh, Master Ceremonies. You were Master Ceremonies, it's too. I wore a lot of hats. But you wore a lot of hats, right. <laughs> and then we also had a school of performing arts. There was dance, modern dance, drama, mime, children's workshop. And it says it had the greatest system in the universe, audio system in the universe. It, fixed, it featured a six-channel surrounding sound at 200 watts. <laughs> there you go, surround sound, 1967. Exactly. <laughs> How did you go about getting equipment, audio equipment anyway? Where did you get well, all that were, stuff from? We got some A7s, Altec A7s that were loaned to us by Owsley. And, Stanley uh, Owsley. Yes. And um, they augmented our, our, our little university speakers that we had there before. And uh, I think eventually he took them back. So, <laughs> well, we, we always had the speakers. We had some speakers. We did, yeah. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we had to have had some speakers. I, two, I, two of the, yeah, I had two of the A7s in the old studio, so the, I took them with me. The really odd thing is that um, there was a sound booth that was down to the right of the stage as yeah. you face the stage. You know, typically at a concert, you know, the mixer would be in the in the center, right. you know, mixing. But somehow, <laughs> for whatever reason, them. I guess we wanted the seats. We didn't want to give up space, plus people would have probably been all over them. Sure. You know, we have this booth that's over down on the side. And of course, it also gave them a private place where they could you, right. you could, you know, you could do things in the booth. You could do things. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I, I remember you had Blue Cheer playing there, and they had Marshall Amps. And, oh, you know, yes. That, that, that's one of my favorite recollections of the straight. What Blue Cheer would what do is, is they would have had these great Marshall stacks, Dickie right? Peterson and, and what and, and what they would have us do is they would put turn down all the lights to black, and all you would see coming in, you know, all the audience would see would be the pinpoint, you know, and lights the on the amps, okay? And they would walk on stage, they would lean their guitars up against the Marshall stacks, and then they would turn them up to 10, and walk away for like five minutes. This is why I now support hearing through my foundation, <laughs> you know? And these, these marshals would be like roaring, just like, you know, like a 707. Right. You know, you could probably hear it out on the street. And then they'd come out and start playing Summertime Blues, right? Right. 
Did the lights go up at that point? Uh, yeah, was there a lighting? Yes. Did you have lighting? Did, was there a truss with lighting? Um, yeah. Were there spots or anything to put Did lights on? Yes, we, had, on the... we had some spots. Um, and, and Brent, Brent found a, a, a big spot. discount deal on some some uh, military PAR spotlights that we fashioned into floodlights and put them every so often. So we were yeah. basically operating with found materials. Found materials, yeah. And we had access to, like, you know, the SRI laboratory and a few places where we could get a few goodies from time the to time. studio so, instrument right yes. Yes. No, the Stanford no. Research Institute. Oh, wow. That's so. a you, whole other depository. And did you get equipment for the Mitchell brothers as well? Didn't you get something from there? Uh, who were they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the Mitchell brothers who were running the O'Farrell Theater and were showing the films um, behind the green door. Oh, I think we got a projector. From a projector. The, yeah, we got them. a projector from the Mitchell brothers, yeah. That eventually, what did we do with that thing? We made it into a time capsule. Yeah, we actually created a straight theater time capsule back in the 70s? No, in the 80s. Early 80s. We created a straight theater time capsule, which was painted gaily, you know, sure. the, out of the housing of a 35 millimeter movie projection arc unit, lamp. right? Yeah. The, yeah, for where the arc lamp goes in, it's got the little windows, sure. and it lifts up like a seagull wing, uh, you know, Mercedes Benz, you know. And we invited all kinds of people who we knew from the old days over to my house out in Lafayette, and everybody had to bring something to put in this thing. And Victor Moscoso was there, and you know, just a lot of folks. Sure. And we created a time capsule, which the plan was that in the 20th anniversary in 87, I guess that's when it was, we would announce to the world that this, it would be okay. unearthed. And uh, unfortunately, you know, once we had done it, we wanted to make a wonderful videotape of everybody holding up the thing that they were putting in the time capsule. Oh, wow. Did which someone have a old, copy of You them? know, dried out magic mushrooms to love 20 beads. year old mushrooms he donated to the. Yeah, those are draft notices. Right, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. great. <laughs> but so we had so much fun doing that that once it was done, we didn't have to, you know, discover the time capsule because, you know, we had, we had our fun and that sure. was that. So it was auctioned off at Butterfields. Yes. So, yeah, we, so we, we, I would love to see some of these posters. If you wouldn't mind maybe holding them up one at a time. Posters? And we could, we yeah, could, maybe some of the bands that are listed on there are bands that... Um, what is, that? Now, what does this one say? Okay, you won't see this too many places because of its semi-erotic nature. This okay. is one of the rarest Mick, Rick Griffin posters out there. Oh, it's um, wonderful. Does this work? How do you want this? That's fine. But... Um, these go for four or five hundred dollars if you can find one. And I think you're underestimating it at the moment. I think so. Too. Yeah, you know what? Because of eBay, everything's gone up. So we'll take that numbers, poster and put it down there. on your table, mm -hmm. flat, and then we'll hold up the next one. So who is it's one hard one? to read. This is Randy Solace, okay? Randy Solace, you can straighten it out a little bit. Oh, Jenny, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you, hang, okay. if you carry it lower, too. there we go, no, much better. Yeah. Uh, okay, but keep them together, or keep the outside. So what is this event? Um, and Randy also, in addition to several posters for you us. did this one, Randy? Solace. Uh, Solace. S-A-L-A-S. Okay. Yes. And, and Randy created a giant um, canvas that was above the, uh, uh, the refreshment stand as you came into the Straight Theater, which was basically, okay, it's, there's another poster that has it and it's not here, but was a giant zodiac. It was beautiful. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was commissioned by this friend of ours. And, uh, How big was this? It was, the... oh, it must have been five by five or wow. six, by, six by six. I mean, it was, you know, <coughs> and it was above the refreshment counter in the straight theater. But he's, he's a great this artist. This is wonderful. This is, but what's on the back is even more interesting. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, that's my brother's contribution. I've saved this because it's the only one I've got. But sure. But there are, this there are some others. Two dollar admission. This was a benefit for to raise money for the straight theater. At the Avalon Ballroom. At the Avalon, Avalon Ballroom. And John Helms, he, he was helping us. He wanted us to succeed. Who, who, who did this? This was done by, what's it say, Jacob. I don't remember who Jacob was, but... Because yeah, it looks like a Wes Wilson kind of thing. Yeah, and the Grateful Dead played for that. The Grateful Dead, they were always at, off, at the theater often because they lived right up the right street. Right up the street. Yeah. Well, and they rehearsed in the theater in for, they a year, for a year. I mean, while we were it's a place to renovating it, they rehearsed. And so every day there would be kids 
street people like you know hanging out with their ears pressed against the doors of the theater, sure. the fire doors, you know, and trying to get in whatever door would open, you know, to come in and see the dead. Right. But it wasn't the dead as people know it today. It was the no. beginning. Well, of the this, dead, this yeah. is with pig pen. Sure. Yeah. With so pig pen. What yeah. is this now? Um, what what is this advertising? Kaleidoscope. It's a, this was Chad oh, yeah. Hunter. This is a Chad yeah. Hunter. This, this is by an artist named Chad Hunter, and, um, and and it's Kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope came out from L.A. Kaleidoscope was a great band that featured David Lindley, oh, okay. the guitar player David Lindley, and uh, and they played kind of a fusion music, kind of world music, right. because they used they used uh, you know tablas and they used sitars and all of that kind of thing. James Cotton awesome. Blues Band. They were awesome. Oh, he was there often. James Cotton Blues Band. Yeah. Right. As was Paul there. Butterfield. Uh, Paul Butterfield did, was not there a lot. I don't. In fact, this might have been the only time. Or maybe I'm thinking of Harvey. Uh, oh, oh no, no, I'm mean, thinking of Charlie Muscle. I'm thinking Charlie of Charlie Muscle. Right. And this one here, we're looking at, it's in color of the Straight Theater. Um, it's a two-day show, kinetic dance happening. Um, can you do you remember this event? The Congress of Wonders. What's the Congress of Wonders? Yes, Luther. Oh, the Con Congress of Wonders was a three-person comedy group. It was actually very funny for their time, and they would they did one on an aging Jerry Garcia on a park bench reminiscing about the old days. And <laughs> they had Lone Stranger, and they had some great skits. Um, yeah. And there's some tape of them that you probably want to insert here because they they, they predated. Well, they were probably contemporary with the committee. Huh? That's sure. Kind of, a little bit after. It's an on, it was yeah. an ensemble thing, right? You know. Um, and Reggie actually managed them for a while. I'd love to see something else. Yeah, we yeah well, there's the Luther Green yes. black and white famous yes. poster. Yes. Well, let's that's, see it. It's the one I'll sell on eBay. <laughs> Written, now know. that's wonderful. Yeah, see, the, another thing I didn't mention in, in the flyers, rather than the posters probably demonstrated. Work better, it out. We, we, we kind of didn't have money after a while to pay for, you know, real poster sure. artists to do real posters. And so it got to where we would all take turns do, doing sure. <laughs> flyers for the exactly. theater. And he did a lot of them because at least this he had some artistic talent. This is one of whole collage. And yeah. I mean, you realize you don't have computers in these days and you're doing your own. It's hard know, to imagine. Four yeah. color separations, if you will, well, color. And now they have letter set. That was letter set. Oh, okay. It's like press time. <laughs> you know? Okay. How much are we? We have 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, there you go. This is a it costs two dollars and fifty cents to come to a dance. This is a classic. Grateful Dead <clears throat> the Sons of Champlin. This is a classic flyer. It's wonderful. Now Janice Joplin played at the theater. A lot. Uh, with the Quicksilver as well. Now as I recall and I'm not big certain brother. or with, with, big, with brother. big Brother. If if I recall, did she ride in there one New Year's Eve on a motorcycle? No, that wasn't well, her. But, but on New Year's, we, the two New Year's that we celebrated, I guess, we tried to do something outrageous. And one year, I think it was the first year, we had um, the Hells Angel uh, rode in through the theater doors and down the aisle on his Harley with a naked woman on the back. That was, <laughs> that was very cool. This would not cool. happen at the Fillmore scene. This is the thing about the straight, because where it was and because of the chaos of Haight Ashbury. Sure, sure. You know. Anything went. Anything went. And, right. and then the, I think the next year, unless I have these years turned around, it doesn't matter. Sure. We lowered a naked woman from the ceiling, <laughs> you know, from way, way up above the proscenium stage, right down to the stage. And she danced down. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's dream come true. <laughs> you were arrested at one point. We for... talked about we, we we talked about that the, the new dance concert. Exactly. Oh, okay. Blue, blue uh, Oh, this can, was can a big, this. this was a big deal. Okay, Magical Mystery Tour, uh -huh. sure. Beatles movie. Let's get it on camera. Yeah, we did a... Go ahead, pull this it was kind of toward the end no. of our stay there, wasn't it? It was like 1968, and we were trying to figure out how to remain open and trying to raise money. And didn't this show at the Pagoda in North Beach? Yeah, I did. Well, at the, the, same, the same time, came PX. The original freeform November 19, radio 19, station. Um, yes, there you go. KMPS was a radio station headed up by a fellow by the name of Tom Donahue, and they were they got thrown out of their premise at 50 Green Street, and they were or they were on strike or something like that, and so they were looking for a way to get some money, and so um, 
Tom through connections got them and us as a co-benefit of the first American screening of Magical Mystery Tour. And this is great. So we have, since it's coming in on a plane in the afternoon of a certain day, and so we, we set up the first show at what time? Midnight or something? And, and uh, so Milo and Melvin from KMPX and I were driving down to SFO to go to the custom shed to pick up Magical Mystery Tour, which they didn't want to give to us. So after going back and forth for about two or three hours, and meanwhile back at the theater... The place is packed. It's got a magical mystery tour of the Beatles on the marquee. And you haven't people handed sitting, the film People sitting, standing yet. everywhere, and people are starting to stamp, you know, on the floor because the bands aren't playing anymore. And there's a line going all the way down to the pan of people waiting to get in. And you're and in custom trying to get the So we finally, through. somehow, we, we, we got the print from the customs officer, and we got it in, in my car, and my one was driving, I was in the back seat, and I wanted to examine it. And it's a timing print, and in England they had tied little thread, threaded knots on all the perforations where they wanted a timing change for some reason. So the print is unshowable. So I'm sitting, my one's driving 100 miles an hour, and I'm sitting there with a Swiss Army knife cutting all the string off the print of Magical Mystery Tour. Oh my goodness! So we made it to the theater, came in, showed it. Uh, Cheers go up. We showed it for like 24 hours solid, and we set the house record for the Hate Theater for all time. We got, we got 25,000 dollars or something in a 24-hour period. Wow. And so half of that went to KMPX, and we got the other half, and it kept us in business for probably another months. four months or something. Amazing. That's a great so story. The, the, uh, the, the uh, telegram oh. from the Beatles, which is addressed to Chet Helms, right? It went to the Avalon for some reason. Yeah. Here you are having difficulty. You know you have our support and our love for what you and yours represent, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. You can imagine how like it made you feel like in 1968, okay, to get a kind of, you know, telegram. Totally. Can relate. <laughs> totally can relate. Um, yeah. We are going to be calling you back soon before we close this interview. Um, and we're, we are going to take the time to film everything you brought. Um, just... I mean, it's hard to, in a moment, it's easier when you're just talking with each other. If you, each of you, I want to ask, if, if, if you could say one more thing that people should not forget about, the straight theater. What happened there? How you felt about it? Uh, what it means to you? What would, what would that be? And, and I'll start with you, uh, um, Luther. Well, if it was there to do all over again, I would just wish that there, that it would be possible in this day and age for it to be there to do all over again. Absolutely, I would do it again. Right. And um, I'm really grateful for you giving us the opportunity to be interviewed and tell our story because it's my impression that the history of the straight theater and the Haight Ashbury during that period of time has never been accurately recorded and there's been many stories told and, and lots of material written, but um, it's never been accurately recorded and so um, I just want for people to know what really happened in the theater and um, how it evolved and the struggle of what those of us in the community were going through because we really were on the front line on Haight Street. Sure. Yeah, and, and from the standpoint of the person that was, you know, booking the bands and dealing with the, mu with the music, you know, Bill Graham and Chet Helms had the city locked up. You know, we could not get a lot of the big acts, we got a few sometimes for whatever reason, you know, that we were able to, not just because of money, but because Bill particularly, sure. you know, didn't want other people, you know, booking the bands, you know, he wanted to have them at the Fillmore. And uh, there was that tug of war going on between Bill and Chet, and we're kind of over there, you know, basically serving as the, uh, the, the proving ground for bands that are hoping, to make you know, it, that yes. they need to play at the Fillmore or the Avalon. And, um, and enabling some of those people to stay alive. You know, there were some, some pretty good, talented musicians sure. um, that, you know, never... It seemed like you were accessible, that the people could get to you. They could experience much easier. They could be part of it. They could volunteer. Um, they could try their new act. They could play in their band and hope to get to the Fillmore or the Avalon. You were way part of the community. It was even though it's a private endeavor, but it was the community helping and keeping it going, and you were right there in the middle of it. And uh, that's why, I mean, so many people we speak to, the straight theater means so much to so many people that you guys 
have no idea the stories we hear, you know, and uh, um, the more and more that we, we set the record straight, add information, all this hard work and all this fun will not be forgotten, and it shouldn't be. Because, not by us, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't be because of because who it influenced, what it was for people, it, beyond what you may even know yourself. You know, if you ever stood in the corner of your venue and you watched smiles on the faces of people, mm -hmm. your hard work made that happen. As uh, it was a refuge for some people, a place to go, a place to be, a place for people to be creative whether it's in plays or dancing or in playing music or reading whatever, it was a place mm -hmm. where people were not intimidated by it being what it was. It, they felt it was theirs. It was theirs in the community. And uh, such an historical time that happened, um, and you were part of it, you know. We are going to continue doing interviews. We will continue adding information to the files and, and be documenting more stuff and totally including you in this. Um, so that the, the record is set straight. And as more and more players um, come our way, we'd love to interview Reggie, and we'd love to interview a few more people as they're, they're given to us to, to document. Um, your, your work in this period, yes, maybe it was fun. You rolled up your sleeve, it was hard work, mm -hmm. but it created something that you, your three of you, have no idea. The thousands of people that remember, the thousands and thousands of people that remember the straight theater the same way they remember Hate Street. But you know? did it really happen? <laughs> did it really That's happen? That's the next segment. <laughs> or, was it, or was it an alternate universe? This is what we ask ourselves. <laughs> Super. Well, you know, basically, I'm going to ask all three of you the same. We have about two, three minutes left on this tape. Um, and, you know, if you want, if there's anything else you would like to share, tell us. Tell the people of the, uh, the our great great grandchildren in the future that view this and see what happened in this Bay Area, in the Haight Ashbury during the sixties. Um, you guys had a calling. You were brought into it. Um, if you want to share anything else for a moment about the future, I've each I've asked you each individually. Well, I would share one thing from from my experience with experimenting um, with drugs during that period of time. It was common to have gurus or people that kind of counseled you when, when you used substances, especially if they were mind-altering. And I have no idea if people will be using mind-altering substances, you know, 100 years from sure. now. But I remember my first experience that my older brother was the first person that introduced me to cannabis, to marijuana. And the first LSD I ever had was given to me by Luther, and it was pure LSD sure. from Sandoz Laboratory, the best that you could get. And um, and then Reggie, who was part of the theater, and my brother, I went with them to the Big Sur State Far um, Forest and had my first LSD experience. And so my counsel to people in the future is, is just only get your drugs from people that you really trust. <laughs> And it's a spiritual journey. Yeah, and it's a and spiritual it's a journey. journey. So with be with people that right. that you trust and have it still continue. Because drugs were used in a very spiritual way in the beginning. And it got very confusing toward the end in the Haight-Ashbury. Because also, the nature of what people were using changed. I also feel that it's a specific time. The time of the 60s this cannot be reproduced. We can each tell our story. And at least we're getting the, the the accurate information, but there's something to be said about you had to be there, mm -hmm. you had to be there, and it was a specific time to to take psychedelics and to mm -hmm. drop out, turn on whatever it was, and that it's not always a good time to be taking these drugs in the environment in the changes of our world. This is a once in a lifetime decade that happened and it's happened you know so i relate to what you say and if anything more the focus of that period of drugs and hallucinogens mm -hmm. was about the music was about being part of a family feeling safe and uh we're not in the 60s now but we have felt the effect of the 60s with so many things in the world, and each of you know that, each of you have your own, from recycling to uh, the evolution of 
of the industry and venues and theaters. You can go now to shows where 300,000 people can attend a show. And you were part of the beginning of this because before the Strait, before the Avalon, before the Fillmore, you went to a club to see a band. And now you had a venue of 1,000, 1,200 people, and now you can go to a coliseum and be part of 300,000 people watching the show as the sound systems, as on, the on that note. public assembly uh, was created. And what happened within your world that you touched upon not only touched the Bay Area and the hate, but the world. So we want to thank you so much. Thank you for letting us tell the story. My pleasure. Thanks, Roberta.